All right, let's get started, everyone. Welcome, hello, and welcome to the third webinar in our five-part series on food allergy fundamentals. My name is Marie Malloy, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, which is focusing on anaphylaxis. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available in FAIR's Food Allergy Academy in approximately one week. A follow-up email will have details on how you can access it. To make sure we can maintain a quality recording, everyone is muted throughout the presentation. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom screen throughout the presentation. That also allows you to communicate directly with my FAIR colleagues and myself. At the close of the webinar, there'll be a link to a survey. Please let us know how we did. If you are seeking continuing education credits from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, you must fill this out. Certificates are sent within a week. Also, if you are interested in joining FAIR in Orlando this fall at our Food Allergy Summit, you can find out more information by going to the webpage address on the slide on your screen, foodallergy.org backslash summit. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. John James. Dr. James has worked in the field of allergy, asthma, and immunology for 30 years, for over 30 years. He is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and has clinical experience in the diagnosis and management of allergic diseases and asthma, with a special interest in food allergy and anaphylaxis. Dr. James was a medical school faculty member at the University of Arkansas in Little Rock and worked with Colorado Allergy and Asthma Center for 24 years before retiring in 2020. He has served on many food allergy related professional boards and committees and in 2021 started a medical specialty consulting business called Food Allergy Consulting and Education Services. Dr. James, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Marie, for that introduction and thanks Fair for uh, allowing me to participate in these webinars. This is the third one we've done this year. Uh, these, these are my disclosures. I, am, I do have my own consulting business, uh, as Marie mentioned, and I, I work with the Food Allergy Research and Education, and, and I'm a consultant with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. So this slide will provide an outline of our webinar today on anaphylaxis. We'll talk about the definitions, uh, some epidemiology features. We'll spend time on clinical signs and symptoms, risk factors. We'll spend a lot of time on medical management. And at the very end, I'll try to get to some cases, some actual cases, and then some common misunderstandings of anaphylaxis. So as an introduction, again, food allergy in general, it is a, a body's immune system sees a certain food as harmful and reacts to that by causing symptoms. So it is an adverse reaction mediated by a specific immune response, typically an IgE-mediated response. Common food allergens include peanuts, cow milk, egg, tree nuts, and shellfish. Allergic reactions can cause adverse symptoms in the skin, mouth, eyes, the gastrointestinal tract, lungs, heart, and brain. Mild and severe symptoms can lead to serious systemic allergic reactions called anaphylaxis, and that's where our focus will be today. These can be life-threatening reactions. On the other hand, a food intolerance is an adverse physiologic reaction to a food that is not mediated by a specific immune response in the body. An example would be lactose intolerance. So um, the food allergy diagnosis stepped approach is, we're going to spend some time on this. We're going to talk about the importance of a detailed and thorough clinical history as an important first step, Discuss, uh, discussing when, uh, thinking about specific testing, if clinically indicated, the types of testing, uh, skin prick testing, uh, serum IgE and component testing, and arranging for a food challenge if needed and if clinically indicated. And finally, patient education. So some of these first steps we have covered in the first two webinars, but we'll, I'll build that into the discussion of anaphylaxis where appropriate here. So the diagnosis of food allergy, again, the clinical history is so important and I can't stress that enough. It needs to focus on the specific signs and symptoms that are suggestive of an, of an allergy. 
the timing of the reaction following the food ingestion. Is it minutes? Is it, is it uh, up to a couple of hours? The amount of food ingested, uh, is it raw or cooked forms of the food? Uh, is it a reproducible reaction? That's very important. A what happened in terms of treatment? What, did the patient need no treatment? Did they, did they get uh, maybe some antihistamines or did they have anaphylaxis and they need epinephrine? The epidemiology of the food allergy, well, what are the more common ones uh, like peanut, egg, and milk versus some less common food allergens and how they differ between infants, children, and adults. And then uh, you hear more and more about this cofactors uh, like exercise, medications, like non steroidal medications like Motrin or Aleve, alcohol, um, menses, illnesses, viral illnesses, and how those can impact an allergic reaction and even an anaphylactic reaction. Can it lower the threshold for one of those reactions to occur? So we'll talk about uh, those things as well today. So, what is anaphylaxis? The definitions. The origin of the word anaphylaxis comes from Greek, and ana, the first part of it, means against, and phylaxis means protection. So it's against protection, and it 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 was coined. The term was coined in in around the turn of the century, 1902, when they were doing studies, uh, you know, physiologic studies, um, to look into this, and that the the definition sort of was coined then and has held true since then. Anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction that is rapid onset and may cause death. As I said earlier, it's life-threatening in, in, in some cases. Uh, the lifetime prevalence of anaphylaxis has been estimated to be between 0 0.5 and 2%. So the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, there's been many, this has been worked on for many, many years. And and FAIR, the, the original organization, FAN, that they, they were very involved with the NIH in coming up with diagnostic criteria to, uh, to have a diagnosis that was meaningful both clinically and for research purposes. And the diagnosis is highly likely when any one of these three criteria are met. These, are, these seem a little complicated here, but let me walk through them. The first one is that an acute onset of an illness with involvement of the skin, mucosal tissue, or both, and at least one of the following, respiratory or cardiovascular. So say wheezing or shortness of breath for respiratory and cardiovascular, low blood pressure or uh, poor perfusion. So that's one way it could, the anaphylaxis could be, the diagnosis could be made. The second is two or more of the following that can occur rapidly after exposure to a likely allergen like peanut ingestion. So it, it has to have involvement of the skin or mucosal tissue in the mouth and, um, and tongue and lips, respiratory or cardiovascular compromise, or persistent GI symptoms. So there needs to be two of those at least uh, to make the diagnosis of anaphylaxis. And the third one is very worrisome because this is dealing with cardiovascular system, a low blood pressure after exposure to a known allergen. So that would be the only necessary criteria to make the diagnosis because it's a very serious uh, manifestation of, of anaphylaxis. So the use of these criteria to diagnose anaphylaxis was found to have a positive predictive value of 68% and negative predictive value of 98%. So positive predictive value means that if, if, it's, if it's positive, is it, what's the likelihood it really is uh, anaphylaxis? Uh, if you don't have any of these things, see the negative predictive value is very high, the meaning that if you don't have these things, it's, you're going to rule out anaphylaxis in the, in the history and in the presentation. So let's go on to symptoms of anaphylaxis. Many of you are very familiar with these, but I just want to put them all out there in, in one big picture. So it's a spectrum, starting with the skin, itching or pruritus, hives or dicaria, facial redness or erythema, and flushing can be not only in the face, it can be all over the body. Angioedema, which is a deeper hive or deep is swelling, can be of the lips, can be the eyelids, can be of the throat. Uh, some people complain of a funny taste, a metallic taste in the mouth when they're experiencing anaphylaxis. The next would be gastrointestinal. Uh, and this is vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and cramping. Those can be all together, or you may just have cramping, cramping, uh, with, with skin symptoms with respiratory. 
Respiratory symptoms becoming more serious now as we go along here. Respiratory could be hoarseness, problems with the voice, uh, with the vocal cords, swelling of the cords, uh, not functioning properly, edema of the cords, strider, a very high-pitched voice because the vocal cords are not open and closing properly, um, shortness of breath or dyspnea, cough can be a repetitive cough, um, or wheezing. So those are respiratory. And then cardiovascular, as I mentioned earlier, these are definitely going to be more uh, worrisome than severe. So dizziness, decreased blood pressure or hypotension, poor color, um, abnormal heart rhythm, like an arrhythmia. Some people might experience that during anaphylaxis. Syncope, like just fainting or passing out. Shock, which means poor perfusion, poor function of the heart, um, which is, these are all very serious manifestations of a systemic allergic reaction. In terms of a central nervous system or brain, you can have disorientation, lightheadedness, dizziness, loss of consciousness, which is, again, a very serious manifestation. And then others that you'll hear about are people feeling that there is impending doom or something terrible is about to happen when they have their reaction, say, to a shellfish or to they eat a, sh a shrimp or they eat peanut or egg or something, and they go into anaphylaxis, they may feel this, uh, this impending doom sensation. So other features of anaphylaxis, they typically the symptoms have a rapid onset. They can occur within minutes, but can go up to a few hours after exposure to the trigger. Usually two or more systems are involved. And we, we covered this digestive vomiting, diarrhea, skin, hives, and severe itching, respiratory, cough and wheezing, and um, laryngeal symptoms. Food-induced anaphylaxis commonly presents within 30 minutes of exposure to a food allergen ingestion. And cofactors, as I alluded to earlier, these can raise the risk of anaphylaxis or lower the threshold for it to occur. And this can include uh, alcohol ingestion around the time of the food allergen ingestion, viral infections around that time, exercise, so exercise occurring uh, before the ingestion or after the food ingestion and then exercise, that's a common scenario, uh, temperature changes, menstruation, stress, and then non anti-inflammatory drugs that I mentioned earlier, like Motrin and Aleve. These can, these are called cofactors and can change the threshold of an anaphylactic reaction. So this is um, just a cartoon of what I had. I'm not gonna go through those because we covered all those symptoms, but just for you to see that it, it, it can involve many systems, can, can, can be a couple of, usually at least two systems, but can involve all systems in anaphylaxis. So uh, it's a, definitely a severe allergic reaction. Uh, caused by a group of symptoms that we've covered. The symptoms may occur shortly after having contact with the allergen, like an ingestion, and worsen rapidly. They can be reversed if appropriately treated, and the treatment of choice is epinephrine, as, as most of you do know, and this should be the first line of therapy for anaphylaxis. I'm going to cover that in detail. And these reactions can be fatal, even though very, very uncommon, they can be fatal. So we'll start with some uh, information about infants and anaphylaxis. Uh, it becomes a little more difficult because they, infants cannot verbalize their symptoms and it makes it more difficult to know if, if this is in fact um, uh, an anaphylactic reaction. But some things to look for in terms of behaviors would be lethargy, fussiness, crying inconsolably, uh, irritability or behavioral changes. And Anaphylaxis in the infants um, can, can, can involve the skin most of the time, respiratory tract again, and GI symptoms. So this is a challenge. This is a challenging age group, but, but it uh, is one we need to be, we need to have our, you know, be, be very uh, careful and be, pay attention to it because we can definitely make a difference in recognition and treatment if, it, if these um, if things happen. So the common triggers um, for, for food-induced anaphylaxis, or for anaphylaxis in general, I should say, are foods, and this is a peanut shown here, 
of medications like antibiotics, penicillin, sulfa drugs, and then bee stings or hymenopter stings, which are honeybee, wasp, yellow jacket, hornet, and fire ant. So these are common, these are the three of the most common triggers for anaphylaxis in general. Food triggered anaphylaxis is most frequently observed in children. Drugs and bee sting or venom induced anaphylaxis is more commonly seen in adults. In children and adolescents, uh, this is from uh, Europe, the European Anaphylaxis Registry has reported foods as a trigger in two thirds of the cases and insects in about 20% um, of the cases. So for triggers, there's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of factors here. So different parts of geography can play a role here because you may have some parts of our country where you're gonna have more insect sting allergy or more uh, food allergies might be seen in, in different areas. But so it, it's not the same everywhere and definitely not the same throughout the world. Infants uh, up to two years of age, cow milk, cow milk and egg are the most common food allergen triggers followed by peanut, sesame seed, and fish in areas where these are consumed. Among adults with food allergy, about half experience a severe food, food allergy reaction. And many of these adults are allergic to not only one food, but multiple foods. And finally, this, this uh, struck me uh, recently when I was reviewing information that adults, 48% of them developed allergies as adults. So they didn't have allergies when they were an infant, a child, a teenager, it may, maybe even a young adult. So it's it, it is something that uh, these are new, newly developed allergies. And I saw this a lot in my training, like for shellfish and tree nuts, because these are foods that we would see more commonly in adults. In the United States, the top nine foods associated with anaphylaxis include peanut, cow milk, tree nuts, egg, shellfish, finfish, wheat, soy, and sesame seed. And a recent study in adults found the prevalence of food allergy is about 10%, which is also higher than I had. This has developed over time. This wasn't something, say, 10, 20 years ago that we thought it was that high. So this is a number that, is, that has become available more recently with good research studies. So what about the route of exposure? So I have three listed here. First of all, ingestion, which is an obvious one. It's, the mo it's most relevant in systemic or anaphylactic reactions, and it depends on the amount of the food ingested and the form of the food. Is it baked? Is it non-baked? Is it raw, et cetera? So that ingestion is going to be what most people think about for a food allergy-induced anaphylactic reaction. But there's also inhalation. So um, it's possible with food allergies that have been aerosolized or, or brought into the air, the steamed milk, cooked fish, shellfish. So it's, someone's having a, a a fish boil or a crawfish boil, whatever, it's going to have that steam coming up is going to carry some of the allergen and it can move about that environment. And if someone's allergic, they could inhale those protein allergens and potentially have a reaction. So those can cause respiratory symptoms or even anaphylaxis with severe allergy. In contact, this is through the skin. So uh, contact or topical exposure of the food allergen through the skin, especially if the skin is disrupted like eczema or some other breakdown in the skin, the allergen may penetrate and then have access to the immune system and cause an allergic reaction. So these are the main areas of exposure to the food allergen that could lead to an allergic reaction and even anaphylaxis. Exercise-induced anaphylaxis is an uncommon trigger for anaphylaxis with the prevalences listed here. Um, anaphylaxis can occur following physical activity. The intensity it can elicit symptoms or the intensity can be different. Like it, it may be in some people, they don't have to do real high intensity exercise and they have anaphylaxis, but more than not, it's usually a more in, intense uh, cardiovascular type uh, activity. It can be associated with cofactors that I mentioned earlier, like a specific food before exercise, uh, temperature changes, medications, usually non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the most commonly um, identified. If food is a cofactor, the correct term is food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. 
And then wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis is one of the more common ones that has been uh, written about or observed. It's um, triggered after the ingestion of wheat in combination with exercise. So this is the one that was really studied early on and but, there, but other foods can be in that combination to cause exercise induced anaphylaxis. Alpha gal syndrome, you may have heard about this. It's been, it's been uh, was identified a couple of decades ago and it's been more and more information has become available. It's become more on the radar for people to think about this or hear about it in the lay press or in the medical literature. It is a delayed allergic or anaphylactic reaction following the ingestion of mammalian meats, as I've listed here, beef, pork, lamb, et cetera. Uh, it is an Ig-mediated food allergy, but it's to a carbohydrate, not to a protein in the food. And this is the um, term here, it's the alpha-gal, uh, is abbreviated from the galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. And it's um, that carbohydrate can be seen in mammalian meats, and the interesting thing is that when it was originally described, they found that many patients had an association with tick bites, the, mainly the Lone Star tick in the southeastern part of the United States. And that resulted in allergic sensitization to the alpha-gal. And that was present in mammalian meat. So when that combination was found, then these reactions occurred. Uh, the symptoms are, a lot of times when I'd see this in clinic, it would be people who they notice their symptoms in the middle of the night. So they have a meal, maybe a dinner, and then they wake up several hours later in the middle of the night with hives, swelling, maybe anaphylactic symptoms, really intense intestinal symptoms. Um, so it was several hours after they ingested the meal, um, as it says here, four to six hours later. And the really, with most food allergies, it's appropriate food elimination or restriction in terms of key to management. So it is something you may have heard about. It has certainly been out there. It's not, it's not uh, new anymore. It was definitely an interesting, when it first came out, it was an interesting new um, disorder that was um, described and has been followed very closely uh, by the allergy community. So food allergy reactions, uh, some other considerations. Um, the majority episodes do involve the skin. So hives are urticarious, angioedema, or swelling of the lips. Um, but anaphylactic reactions can occur without skin symptoms. This is important to know. Patients may have really intense gastrointestinal symptoms with some respiratory symptoms, but they have absolutely no hives or swelling. There are cases where the heart or cardiovascular or GI symptoms come before skin symptoms. So for the heart, we talked about blood pressure changes, poor color, poor perfusion, GI symptoms, obviously the nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, et cetera, before any um, hives or redness or flushing occur. Gastrointestinal symptoms may signify a more severe allergic reaction. Uh, say they just, the patient goes directly into a major um, abdominal cramping episode, vomiting, re repetitive vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera, and pain, pain in the abdomen. Well, this may be their pattern. And if those symptoms come on with, with intensity, they need to be managed very quickly like anaphylaxis with epinephrine and other, other appropriate therapies. Deaths from anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis have been reported, but are rare. So um, timeline of anaphylactic reaction does vary from person to person. It's not going to be the same time frame for each patient, like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's, it can vary. And that's why history is so important that I talked about from the very beginning to get that history, uh, take that detailed, defined history. Um, it can start slow, gradually get worse, or it can go gangbusters from the very beginning right off the bat and, and then progress rapidly. Sometimes a reaction is followed by a second, more severe phase a reaction called a biphasic reaction. Many of you probably have heard of this term. So it's a second wave of allergic or anaphylactic symptoms that occur about four to, hour, four to eight hours after the initial reaction. There may be, the initial reaction occurs, the peak, then it comes back to sort of a baseline, and then there's a peak again uh, four to eight hours after the uh, original reaction started. So reactions need to be recognized and taken seriously. It's important to administer epinephrine early if anaphylaxis 
is suspected and to activate the uh, emergency medical system through 911, et cetera. So this data came out in the last, last couple of years about looking at food-induced anaphylaxis and how it is increasing in the United States. So these were from the United States private insurance claims with a diagnosis of anaphylaxis, and these were monitored and examined from 2007 to 2016. There was an increase in food-induced anaphylaxis from approximately 5% in 2007 up to 22% in 2016. That's a, that's a really significant uh, noticeable change. Approximately 14,000 emergency room visits and 1,300 hospitalizations per year for food-induced anaphylaxis were observed in this study. The incidence of fatal food anaphylaxis is very rare, about one in 10 million, or about the rate of a, of a fatality from a lightning strike. So it's, I guess I've said a few times already, it, 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 anaphylaxis can, it can be life-threatening and there can be fatalities, but it's not, it, it's, it's a more rare outcome. So moving on into laboratory tests for anaphylaxis. Um, Specific laboratory tests may support the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, but they don't confirm it. So mast cell mediators have been shown that you may have heard of tryptase. This is one where we do, if we have a chance, we'll have a blood test done around an anaphylactic event and see if the tryptase is elevated because that helps to say, oh yes, this was anaphylaxis. Histamine, not easy to measure um, and play an activating factor as well. So these are, are things we can measure but they're not specific for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis. You can, you can have false positives. Uh, and they're not universally available to be done. And they're not, uh, not typically obtained to make the diagnosis. The diagnosis is typically made from the history and how the patient responds to treatment. It's not that we can just do blood tests and x-rays and things like that to say, oh, this is anaphylaxis. No, we wish we had that. And there will be in the future, but still going to, the foundation is based on the clinical history uh, and how the patient responded to treatment and trying to identify what the allergen was. So the diagnosis of anaphylaxis is uh, really based on clinical and not laboratory findings. Uh, this slide uh, came from FAIR and it, it's looking at some disparities. And I think the first the, it, it's a multi-center retrospective cohort study of children up to 17 years with food allergies seen in um, allergy immunology clinics. And I think if you look at, I'm going to look at the first two grouping here. The, in, up, up at the top right, it says, uh, has the key there for white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, and Hispanic. So if you look at the percent with food-induced anaphylaxis, well, there's an obvious difference in the uh, percentage of patients with food and anaphylaxis and higher in, in uh, Blacks and in Hispanics. And the same for percent with food allergy related emergency department visits. We know this, and this is true in, in things with, with asthma and eczema. So it, it, it holds true across the board. So I just wanted to, and we are aware of disparities and we need to be aware of that in our, in our working in the clinic and doing research studies, et cetera, to pay attention to these differences and to put our efforts where they need to be. Um, emergency management of anaphylaxis. Number one, uh, patients require immediate assessment and treatment. I mean, this I can't stress this enough. We have to pay attention. We have to have a, a high index of suspicion, especially in people that we know have, have food allergies and have had anaphylactic reactions. But if someone's having a reaction and they never had a food allergy reaction, at least we can identify maybe it is anaphylaxis. We can act appropriately then. Start with removal of the exposure um, suspected trigger. Um, so if we know it's a, if it's a food that's on a tray or something, we can get that out of the way. If it's a bee sting, we can get the patient out of that. If it's a medication, all those things, we're gonna get the suspected trigger away from the patient. Um, we need to assess a patient's uh, sort of like in, in cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we're gonna assess circulation, the airway, the breathing and mental status. And then we're going to think early about if it's anaphylaxis, we want to get the treatment going as soon as we can. Administration of epinephrine uh, is the first line of treatment. I'm going to go over some other slides in this uh, to bring that point home too. There are no absolute contraindications to use epinephrine. It's safe 
and without major side effects. So if you if you're thinking, okay, this is anaphylaxis, but I'm nervous to give epinephrine, it's always best if you're thinking anaphylaxis to treat with epinephrine, and then later we can let that sort out. But because there's not going to be the downside is very low. The upside is huge to be able to treat anaphylaxis and to get the patient in a better situation. Evidence has shown that delayed injections of epinephrine can be associated with increased rate of hospitalization and mortality. So this is a, a slide on dosing. I don't want to go through every line here, but there are different for epinephrine injectable. This is injectable epinephrine intramuscular based on the infant dosing, childhood dosing, and adult dosing. So I'll, I'll leave this up. This is going to be, this is what you're going to see on package inserts and such, but there are different obviously different levels that we give the um, epinephrine in, in the auto injector forms and they they come set that way. So you're gonna, when it's prescribed, you're gonna, it's gonna be based on the weight uh, of, of the patient and, and that's how we, uh, we handle it. This slide um, I like because it gives most of the, of the injectable forms or auto injector forms of epinephrine. And I won't go through the different name brands here, but just to show you, there are many products available, both trade name and generic, and it, they're real similar in how they're administered. I'll go through that, but it gives you some options in terms of what it's going to have to have epinephrine, obviously, different doses appropriate for the age or weight of, of the patient, but uh, also your insurance coverage, and these can be very expensive. So there are options. There used to be only one option for many years when I was early in my training and, and in my practice. There was only one option. You know, we didn't have we didn't have what we have today, which is very nice. So this just gives you a good spectrum of what's available. So the emergency management of anaphylaxis, I don't know how many times I've said this already, but epinephrine is the drug of choice. There needs to be a written anaphylaxis emergency plan. It's crucial and should be followed. Not everyone has one, but boy, these can be so beneficial at schools, at school camps, uh, traveling, air, you know, wherever your airplanes, wherever you're, you know, going overseas. This is can be a very excellent roadmap for what needs to be done. It's good to have two doses of the injectable epinephrine available at all times. Um, Twelve percent of children require more than one dose, and seventeen percent of adults. So it's that's that's significant. Calling 911 and activating EMS, you, so critical because you, you, you want, they'll be able to bring uh, more services for treatment, get the patient taken to where they need to go, but you can stay with the patient and uh, do what needs to be done. Emergency transport to the hospital can be done when needed to monitor for how the patient's responding to therapy. If there's a late phase reaction, does the patient need to be admitted to the hospital or observed in the emergency room for a while? And the histamines, they can be used, but they will not stop anaphylaxis. They should not be used as a frontline uh, treatment for anaphylaxis. That's really, that's not in the picture. It, antihistamines and other, we'll talk about some other meds. They certainly can be there down the road to treat other symptoms, but remember epinephrine is the treatment of choice. And ID bracelets can be very helpful for people who have food allergies and then they go somewhere and someone's able to read that they're allergic to peanut or uh, shellfish, whatever. So after administration of epinephrine, we'd like to have the patient on the back, supplying position, because this helps with uh, the return of the blood to the heart, improving cardiac output, you know, elevate the legs. And then this is ideal. Move to the upright position. The patient is having trouble breathing or vomiting. And then continue to monitor vital signs the best you can, wherever you are. I mean, if you have you can monitor blood pressure and such. That's great, but do what you can do where you are. Supplemental oxygen. This is going to only be coming from the EMS, um, unless you're somewhere where they in, 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 near a hospital. IV fluids. Again, it's going to be what's available. Usually, when EMS or emergency 911 comes, they can start helping with those issues. And epinephrine can be repeated after a five-minute interval if need. That's why they they started having the the dual epinephrine devices together or the twin packs. This is just a general administration I put together because there's so many different ones. I think I'll just walk through this. This is sort of a generic how I look at it. B 
be familiar with the device. Obviously, you got to know what it says or what your healthcare provider tells you about it. Have them demonstrate with the trainer in the office, removing the, uh, taking the auto injector out of the package, removing the safety cap, holding it in the fist, and do not place your fingers on the top or bottom of the device. You don't want to stick the needle through your thumb, and that does happen. Um, and then you want to put the side where the needle's going to come out against the outer thigh, about halfway between the, the hip and the thigh, uh, the outer thigh, and you can go through clothing if needed, and inject, and you'll hear it pop, and you'll and then you hold for at least three seconds. Now, there's going to be some that they're, say, two seconds, some even 10 seconds, but I think most of them are three seconds. So that's where it's important to know your device, what it is saying on that device for that auto injector. New delivery forms of epinephrine, this is exciting, but these are not FDA approved yet, but there is a nasal spray epinephrine that's been studied for quite a while, mainly in healthy volunteers. There's different doses. It's bioequivalent to the intramuscular epinephrine, meaning that once it's in the system, it's gonna hopefully have the same effect. Rapid absorption, lack of serious side effects. There's one called Nefi, N-E-F-F-Y from ARS Pharma. But again, it's not FDA approved, but keep your eyes out on this because this one, it looks like the momentum is building for this product um, to be available. And it's a nasal spray, not an injection into the thigh. Not available FDA approved yet. Sublingual epinephrine, again, this is gonna be not a needle. Um, it's been studied in healthy volunteers. Um, it's a 12 milligram dose. And this is much higher because it's, it's going through, it's gotta be absorbed through the, under the tongue and into the body, the bloodstream, and but ultimately it will be a much lower dose that's seen by the body to treat anaphylaxis. Again, it's bioequivalent, rapid absorption. It's in research trials, getting very close to the highest level of trials needed, but not FDA approved yet. So these are these are two you want to keep your eyes open and, and listen to what's coming out from FAIR and from other organizations to see when these might be available. Okay, and then supplemental therapies. So patients might need to have asthma therapies if they have asthma and anaphylaxis. Antihistamines, well, if they might benefit from having antihistamines and, and oral steroids to treat some of the anaphylactic symptoms that come with the generalized symptoms. So I'm not saying you never use them, but they're not first line treatments. And then follow up, you wanna, I mean, if someone has anaphylaxis, you really want them to be followed up in a healthcare facility, like an emergency room, a clinic, or some place where they can thoroughly evaluate the patient, see if their symptoms are resolved, see if they need more therapy, see if they might need to be observed in the hospital for overnight. Um, monitor for respiratory symptoms. If, if if it's hypotension or blood pressure problems, they're going to need to be admitted to the hospital and monitored for about 24 hours to make sure everything is back to normal. Then at, at discharge, it needs to be appropriate allergen avoidance. If we can find out what the allergen was, like a bee sting or a food, obviously we're going to want to focus on that. Um, a prescription for an epinephrine auto injector and how to use it. The demonstration needs to be done when it's prescribed. I see a lot of times that's not done. Follow up with an allergy specialist. This is critical because they can go into a lot more detail about testing, looking for what are the causes for anaphylaxis, developing that written at, um, anaphylaxis treatment plan, coming up with um, sort of shared decision-making with the family about when they travel, going to school, going to college. These are things that allergies can be very helpful in, in working with the family. And then that written plan that I just mentioned earlier, how to recognize symptoms. List of contacts. I didn't talk about that, but that's important. Got to call that. You know, when you're starting to do the epinephrine and call an EMS, well, got to call. Better call the family and the and the uh, caregivers so that they know what's going on, so that they don't find out. You know, eight hours later, the kids in the in the emergency room. So that should be on the action plan as well. Storage. Uh, this comes up a lot and. Uh, again, it's going to be on the actual device, so it's in there. I know those those paper, those sheets are very complicated with small writing, but it says it has to have this information in there. Is keeping the auto injectors at regular room temperature, 68 to 77 degrees. 
avoiding exposure to extreme heat or cold. If it's left in the car, this comes up all the time. I, I get this question. If it's left in the car during hot summer days or cold winter day, the epi may not be effective. And it's really best, the better measure is to replace it. Um, and this right now is happening across our country and then with these hot days and people forget they leave them in the glove box or in their backpack in the front seat. And then it's, it really can damage the effectiveness of that uh, medicine. Do not refrigerate it. Um, keep the keep auto injectors together and a protective case because you might need that second dose. Look for the expiration dates. It's important. Uh, they're on the device. And then if you open it up, there's a window you can look at for discoloration or turbidity or flex of material in there. Then you would want to replace that device because it could be the epinephrine broken down. So the treatment of choice for uh, anaphylaxis is epinephrine. Uh, laboratory tests uh, may be used uh, to support the diagnosis, but they are not specific. Potential risk factors I, I talked about um, early on, but they can. Uh, I didn't actually talk about asthma. Asthma is a, definitely a risk factor for worse uh, cases of anaphylaxis. So if a, if a patient has asthma and they have anaphylaxis to peanut, well, that's, that's not a great combination. It does happen a lot and that could make their anaphylaxis worse. Uh, peanut tree nut allergies are going to be in a higher risk group for anaphylaxis and delayed epinephrine use or no use, no epinephrine use at all is going to be a, a really a positive risk factor. Um, epinephrine is the first line of treatment for anaphylaxis and there are no absolute contraindications for its use as I said earlier. Um, following treatment of anaphylaxis, uh, patients should be observed until symptoms fully resolve educated on avoiding their triggers, instructed on how to recognize signs and symptoms of reactions, instructed when to use epinephrine and how to use it, and should be given a written emergency care plan. And that is what I was alluding to earlier about the allergist is coming up with this plan, working with the family and the patient, um, key information, listing symptoms, when to administer epinephrine, uh, other medications that could be used like asthma medications, um, activation of emergency medical services, and call in the emergency contacts, parents and other caregivers. This is the plan that's from FAIR, and this is going to be way too small to go over, but I just want, I know you're, a lot of you are familiar with this, but it goes through what I just said, the identification at the top, when to use, uh, when should be thinking about higher risk groups, um, when to start thinking about using, you know, here's the symptoms, severe and mild. I think it's this one here is about how to use the different devices. Again, there's, there's so many now. I don't want to just go over. I want to give you the opportunity to see and find out which one you have, which one was prescribed, and make sure you're comfortable using that. Use a trainer device and follow the instructions within that product so you're storing it properly, et cetera. In schools, we, there's also individual health care plans, uh, 504 plans can be extremely useful working with the school, the, the teacher, the principal, the health care worker there and the family and the physician um, coming up with, uh, you know, preventative plans, uh, recommendations for avoidance measures in the classroom, on field trips, et cetera, guidelines for accessing epinephrine. Uh, where, you know, where is it going to be stored? Is there an epinephrine that's a stock epinephrine that's there? It's not designated to a particular student. Uh, who's going to, who's trained to, to administer that? Who, especially when, when you go on field trips, et cetera. So let's see, we have, I'm going to go through a couple of cases and I know we have time for questions. Um, this is a six month uh, female infant uh, who has eczema and very persistent, difficult to control, started at one month of age, otherwise she's doing great, breastfed exclusively for four months when solids were introduced, rice cereal and some selected fruits. Egg was introduced at five months of age for the first time. She developed some vomiting within an hour and some uh, hives around her mouth. No treatment was needed. So did not need to go in, no treatment. Egg was held for a month and then the family reintroduced egg at six months of age and 
she developed immediate and significant vomiting, hives that were generalized, so pretty much all over, significant cough, irritability, and the atopic dermatitis or eczema flared. She was treated with antihistamines and egg discontinued. Um, her pediatrician saw her and referred her to an allergy specialist for a consultation. Now, I think most of you are gonna get know that this, the, the likely diagnosis here, especially at bullet point number four, that's a significant history with that second egg ingestion, very consistent with anaphylaxis. And now the pediatrician has referred the, the patient to an allergist for further workup. So diagnosis of anaphylaxis to egg was most likely just based on the clinical symptoms, multiple systems involved and generalized symptoms. Allergy testing is not really necessary here because it was such a classic history. A lot of times there will be testing done, but you don't, this is an, an allergist office where you'd say, hey, this history is so classic and convincing that testing would not, and you wouldn't want to test too soon after the reaction anyway. You want to wait enough in the several, you know, uh, several weeks after we want to test. Uh, you'd want to advise on elimination of egg and egg-containing foods. A uh, dietitian nutritionist consult may be needed. You definitely want to start working on the emergency care plan for anaphylaxis. Prescription for epinephrine, injectable, and a demonstration on how to use it. Follow up in six to 12 months, at which time the testing is definitely going to want to be looked at because egg allergy is one of those allergies that can be outgrown or tolerance can develop over time, usually closer to, to two to three years of age. So uh, going back to that, well, on the slide, the previous, I mentioned that the kid had gotten antihistamines and nothing else. But at that point, no one really knew that this was anaphylaxis to egg. Now we know, and we need to have the plan in place in case it occurs again, have a, have a roadmap ready to go. And then I don't think I'll cover one more. I've got several cases, but I think I'll do one because I know we got, we'll have questions. Um, this is a 40 year old, and this really happened when I was in my fellowship at Hopkins in uh, Baltimore many years ago. This is, this is what I would see in clinic. 40 year old man from Baltimore has been in general good health, very healthy, strapping, working on the wharfs kind of a guy. Until six months ago when he developed vomiting, diffuse hives, and some difficulty swallowing within 20 minutes following the ingestion of crab cakes. He has eaten crab, shrimp, lobster all of his life. He's very upset because this is you know, what he's used to, to eating. Um, but this was a definite major reaction he had never experienced before. He, and after that reaction, he did not eat any shellfish species like lobster, crabs, crayfish, anything. Uh, his primary care physician referred him to an allergy clinic. And th the history was very compelling that this could be an anaphylactic reaction to shellfish. So um, we were sus very suspicious that he had an, an anaphylactic reaction to cr crab, one of the shellfish species, due to his clinical symptoms and multiple organs involved, especially the, the problem with his throat swallowing the food, probably laryngeal uh, symptoms as well. It had been a while since he had had the reaction, so testing can be performed because it had been months after his reaction. So he was tested to the variety of shellfish and, and he, he was in fact allergic to, to crab and lobster. So we did it. advice on food allergen elimination. We did an emergency care plan was written. He was prescribed an EpiPen, a twin pack and demonstrated how to use it. And then we followed him up in a year and we, he, it's unlikely he's gonna outgrow this uh, some people want to know they want to get retested, but in an adult, uh, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts are very unlikely to be outgrown. So I think, Marie, I'm just going to go ahead and stop because I, I, that way I'll leave 10 minutes for questions. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we did get a ton of questions. <laughs> um, so, and I apologize to everyone, we will not be able to get to them all, but um, you will get a follow-up email tomorrow um, with how to contact us and happy to um, follow up. Um, but we got a lot of questions about proximity, both to the allergen in the room or a person eating that allergen and then being with the person who's allergic and wondering what the risk is of anaphylaxis 
or a reaction um, that may not be as severe, but um, when people are in proximity of their allergen. I think going back to the slide I had that had the three routes of, of exposure. So ingestion, it's still going to be by far the one where if you ingest the allergen like peanut or shrimp or egg and you're allergic to it, have anaphylaxis, it's going to be a, a quicker, a shorter timeline to go to starting having symptoms because it's right there in the mouth, in the mucosal membrane, et cetera. So the, the allergen is there on those surfaces getting absorbed right away so that it can be minutes or even, you know, right away versus say someone's at a party where they're cooking like a, at a party where they're cooking shellfish and it's in a big pot and they're, the steam is in the air. Well, the, the proteins can be in there. It doesn't mean they're going to be at the same level as ingesting it, but the protein is going to be there. So the amount might be less. And it does take a while for that to get into the air and then to breathe it in. It's not going to be just a, you know, bang, bang kind of thing when you're eating it. So that could take, you know, that could take longer. I'm not saying that it couldn't occur within minutes, but typically it could take long, you know, it could take longer. Um, one of the slides talked about 30 minutes, you know, afterwards, if you go into a place where they're, you know, a restaurant where they're doing that, I guess that's a better example because people, they're cooking in the kitchen and there may, there's steam there. It may not happen immediately. It can, but not always that typical. Okay. And if somebody, if a friend was going to have a play date with someone who just ate their allergen, you know, is there a risk um, if they're in the same room together, that, that proximity of somebody who has ingested the, the, the allergen? Yeah, no, that, that's tough because I don't know exactly what, 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 they, what someone would mean asking that question. Is yeah. it if someone's eating it and then, and then their, their kitchen's in a whole other part of the house and then they go to the playroom somewhere and, but if they got it on there, if, you know, we know studies have been done with topical exposure. It, it's not always in someone who's normal. It may not be, that's not, it's going to have to be more than that yeah. to cause the reaction. But obviously we want to be, be practical and uh, have common sense to not have, you know, not on the skin and have mm. them playing together. If they're eating, we sell to people to, you know, brush your teeth, you know, dip, you know, try to get as much allergen out of the mouth as you can. Those kids then can be placed safely and not have the exposure anyone else in that room. Great, thank you. Um, and speaking of reactions, um, a couple people asked, how common is it to have a biphasic reaction? Do we have any statistics on that? That's a good question. Um, it's definitely, it's, gosh, that's a great question. It's not like half of the people do. It's more like 20% or less kind of thing. It's got not like, going to be a majority for mm -hmm. sure. It's going to be the, the more the minority, 20% or less kind of scenario. Great. Thank you. Um, in terms of fatalities, uh, people were wondering, is the one in 10 million based on the general population or the allergic population? That is more related to the general population. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Because that study was done, um, it was a it was a study looking at a variety of things. It was looking at, you know, looking at the insurance claims, looking mm -hmm. at hospitalizations, looking at all kinds of things. Yeah, it's more the general general population. Okay. Um, if a person had an allergic reaction going into anaphylaxis and did not have epinephrine, maybe it was a first time reaction they didn't know. They even had an allergy or they forgot it at home. What are the best steps uh, if there's no epinephrine available? No oh, epinephrine available? Okay, so to they, if they can call, if they can call any kind of emergency activation system, absolutely needs to be done as quickly as they can think about it. Because that'll at least get things rolling. Then you want to, you know, put the patient, the child or the adult on, put them on their back, knees bent try to get them as comfortable as they can be to help their blood flow back to their heart, at least trying to promote those kind of things and look for any source. Like I said, if there's any, did they eat anything? Is there something still in their mouth? Is there something, is it a bee sting? Is there, are there other, can they remove stingers? Anything, it may, that might be just with a honeybee, but anything, medications, if they can, you know, if there's anything they could get out of them, you know, to try to remove the trigger. 
um, if they have if they have no epinephrine and they have antihistamines, well, I wouldn't tell them not to use them. If that's all they got, you know. Right. If they're in the middle of nowhere, I, they can certainly do that. But it, like we said, it's not going to be the frontline treatment for anaphylaxis. Right. Um, and on the same topic of epinephrine, what if a child had a reaction and there was only an adult epi epinephrine auto injector nearby? Is there a risk of using adult dosage of epinephrine on a child, if that's all you that's, have? That's a great question. And I think the answer would, for my answer would be to use the epinephrine. It's going to be, the, it, the dose might be like, you know, three times what you, you'd want it to be if you had an infant dose of 0.1 milligram and you're using 0.3 milligram. It is a, you know, substantially high dose, but it, it, it can make the, it's going to make the heart rate go fast. It's going to, the blood pressure, it's going to move all those things you want in a reaction is to build those up. But in a little infant, you know, the, the downside still is much lower than the upside of obviously to prevent a life-threatening reaction and the fatality is to have epinephrine on board. And uh, can you, you talk a little bit again about if somebody uses epinephrine and it really wasn't needed, there wasn't a food allergy reaction, uh, you know, people are very, they're scared to use it. They're not sure if it needed to be used, but can you talk a little bit about the safety of, of using it when not necessarily needed? Yeah, I think this has become more of an issue now that we have the unassigned um, epinephrine auto injectors more readily available in schools or in places, uh, not, not in the plane issue, the airlines has become a big issue, even again, uh, about uh, treatment kits. But I think if someone has a reaction that, you know, one of my clinical cases actually was someone who, who had syncope or had, had they, they were getting their blood drawn and they fainted really bad and they, they were out. And what happens if someone says, oh my gosh, this is anaphylaxis and we got to treat. Well, if you use epinephrine, it, it's going to hurt. It's going to make their, they're going to get heart racing. They're going to feel flushing, but it's not typically going to cause a, a serious side effect. It, the, again, the risk benefit of using that medicine. And so the, uh, the side effects on the bad side, it's minimal compared to what the benefit could be. But there are going to be people where this happens, where it's not anaphylaxis, and then someone gives the epinephrine, so it's it's okay. Okay, great, and we'll do one more question, and, I, and, and actually, I don't know if you could go back to the slide, it was in the beginning that went over the different signs of anaphylaxis. Um, there was some, I think it, keep going. There were some questions about maybe what this one right here, what some of those, some of the words meant. And, and if you could just maybe talk a little bit about like what urticaria is um, and um, syncope, things like that, um, that I think that would be super helpful. Okay, so urticaria is the medical term for hives. It basically means you have a, it, it's a, it's a, it's the top part of the skin gets red, raised, itchy, and it's an infusion of some of the allergic cells that cause this reaction. It is, it is basically a skin hive, is urticaria. And angioedema is a deeper form. I call it a deeper form of a hive. So it's the skin actually gets more swollen, like the lips or the eyelids. And it, it, there's, there's fluid into the skin and it makes it swell, like, if you've seen a boxer when they get to come out of a boxing ring, they've got their eyes are just completely swollen, shut almost, or lips swollen. Um, so, so hives is urticaria, yeah, um, angioedema, swelling, dys dyspen dyspnea, <laughs> under respiratory. Yeah, I dyspnea. Can't even say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, good. A dyspnea is shortness of breath. So, you know, basically, the medical term for shortness of breath. Okay. Got yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, another one, syncope. Uh, syncope, yes. Syncope is like a complete collapse. You just kind of, like when someone faints or if you ever had this happen, it happened to me once, uh, I just completely fell over. I mean, I was down on the ground. It, you just completely lose, use your body tone. You just feel like you're, you just fall to the ground or giving blood or someone who has a heart condition 
might have syncope because their heart rhythm is not correct. They're not getting their blood flow properly. The heart's not pumping the amount of blood they need and they just kind of feel they're going to mm -hmm. faint and they fall over. And, and in terms of, and this will be the very last question, um, in, in terms of anaphylaxis, is there such thing as a mild, moderate, and severe anaphylactic reaction? Or once you hit anaphylaxis, it's just, it's very, you know, it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's, and it needs to be um, attended to immediately. Many years ago, I, I think it, many years ago when I was in, in my, fellowship and coming out and before we had better criteria like we've got now for the for the diagnosis of anaphylaxis people would try to like an asthma mild moderate severe persistent asthma no anaphylaxis is it the key is that it, if it's going to be diagnosed as anaphylaxis we saw in those 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 tables that it it, it becomes a systemic reaction well that there's not really a mild moderate severe form of that anymore and it's better not to call it that, because if you're thinking anaphylaxis, you should treat it like anaphylaxis yeah. and not say, oh, I'm going to wait an hour in the middle of the night. I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to call my physician. I'm not going to, I'm going to just wait till the morning. <laughs> no, no, that's not yeah. good. Better to go ahead and be, be, uh, be safe, be conservative, go for it, you know, treat it when needed. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I think, a, a great way to, a great reminder and, and information to end this uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. James. As always, we look forward to the fourth in this series, which will be on uh, treatment. Um, looking at September, we'll let everyone know of a date. Um, everyone, when I close this, you'll see a, a link to do a, a survey. Please let us know how we did, how we can do better. Um, and also you will get an email tomorrow with information how to access this in the future, as well as some um, forms or um, links to some important uh, forms and resources. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. James. Marie. Thanks, everyone.